The area, is, the area is big. It's confined, but it's big. So it's big enough that everybody can find their own space. Yes, the residences are all in that, that way. They start at the top and go all the way down to the seabed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what do you do with territory, with, with property that is abandoned, not interested in being possessed by anyone, sitting in international waters where no one had any claims or jurisdictions? And the answer is, go squat in one. Why not? Uh, squat is not the right term, but in fact Prince Regent Michael's father did occupy one of these fortresses and he occupied it in 1966 when many of us were um, under our mother's care, if here at all. And after a year of clearing out and cleaning up and um, putting lights in so one could see and generally making the uh, place habitable and also after a considerable amount of time spent with the legal people working out what to do with this so-called house in the sea uh, it was decided that legally the, the fortress could be declared as its own country it was more appropriate to declare it as a principality than as a kingdom or an empire. After all, it's only a few thousand square meters in size. And so indeed that happened. And um, the result was very interesting. Um, after the principality was declared by Prince Regent Michael's father, there was a short, breathless pause and the United Kingdom decided they didn't want another country very close to their shores. So they sent out uh, gunboats and marines and other things and there was a long sort of problematic period of several years when the UK thought, well, gosh, maybe we should have either kept this thing, blown it up, or done something so that we didn't abandon it to someone else. Every time the UK attempted to reclaim the property, which it had clearly abandoned and which clearly wasn't theirs to reclaim, they were, can I say, repulsed. Not actually by dramatic force, more perhaps by legal uh, opinion. And through a long period of, say, 10 years or so, the UK got the message through court orders, through cases, uh, and through the reality that, in, in fact, uh, the, the fort was not theirs, and uh, why were they there? the UK got the message to go away, and in fact they did. The question is, what happens when we run out of space and we have to stack people in domino fashion and then they find that they don't like to sleep standing up? We don't have a problem with that because in the declaration of the country, legally and properly according to international law of the time in 1967 our country consists of 4,000 square sorry 0.004 square kilometers <coughs> land and about a hundred square kilometers sea and that takes into account the median line if it's ever drawn between ourselves and the United Kingdom. So we have no shortage of space. We do have a shortage of land space. So it's a, a straightforward matter simply to expand the land, is it not? Ah, but it's not. 
we don't want to see. The problem is that if one expands one's country in a way which provides the coastline, one expands the possibilities for curious seagoing boat people to stop there. At the moment, sea land is a fort. It's inaccessible. You'll not get on it <coughs> without some help from someone there already. The heliport looks very inviting. It's blocked. And if a helicopter tries to land there, it will crash. The, air, the, the, the international aviation community knows this because we have, we, the country, our Bureau of Internal Affairs, which is responsible for such matters, has published to the internal, uh, to the to the international community, a notice to airmen that says, if you want to land on our national heliport, get permission first, or bring along a hospital ship. <laughs> so uh, that's that side. Uh, if you try to if you try to visit Sealand by sea, then you chug along in your boat and you suddenly discover that Sealand is 30 meters above you and there's no way to get there and it overhangs your boat and down the bottom there's no place to tie up the rope. So there are no docking facilities other than those facilities which are made possible from the fort level itself. Now, if we suddenly grow a bit of land, hey, it's not difficult. Sand, mud, dredged from the channel, etc. Then we have a coastline which is comfortably accessed. So the minute we expand by building land, we have to have people to protect ourselves. Extra people. They have to be paid and fed and housed. So the question is, when do we do this? And the answer is, when we've got the resources, and so then the question is, when do you get the resources? And the answer is, when we have the need, then the resources will be available for us to do this. So we can do it. But it's senseless to do it until we can continue to protect ourselves. Now, believe me, this is a problem. This is a problem. Uh, every day, one or the other of our government officers gets at least 10 emails or two or three letters, postal letters, from people who say, please can I come and live? Refugees, stateless persons, people who need a country. And there appear to be a great number. So it's not a problem about people wanting to come. There is a problem about people coming and bringing enough benefit to the country so that we can afford it. The last thing we need are six asylum seekers who appear, expect to be fed, housed, and accommodated in every other way, and have no way to pay for it. It's the last thing we need.